And so what do we mean when we talk about spiritual disciplines or specifically the idea of spiritual formation, spiritual formation? I love the lyrics of the song we sang today because it, it really kind of answers the question. There's some really great theology in the song. Today was the first time that I had really taken note, if you will, of the song. I think I've heard it before, but like we do with a lot of things, I wasn't listening when I heard it. But we sang the song today, Holy Spirit, make me more like Jesus. That's the goal of spiritual formation in our life. The lyrics of the song are so good because it says so much. Holy Spirit, make me more like Jesus every day. What? A little more like Jesus. It's a journey. It's a process. We'll talk about that. And he, then the writer says, crucify my flesh with yours. Lord, it's not me. It's, it's, it's your life in me. And, and he says that my new life might be secured. Everything I do done so I can honor you, resurrect me, sanctify me, make me into your image. This is the goal of spiritual formation in our life. You know, when we think of spiritual formation, we might think, or in, in disciplines, we might think of things like, well, this, it has to do with my prayer life. And, and so how do I become someone who has a more meaningful prayer life? That's going to be part of this. Angela's going to share about that next week. For some of you, the question is around the Bible. How do I understand the Bible better or understand the Bible more? And, and, and really that question is, you know, what is my Bible intake like? Because we all know it's possible at least to read a whole lot and receive very little. But how often is it true that you read very little? And, and I'm not suggesting you read very little, but you read a, maybe one verse and it leaps off the page at you. And, and, it, and you receive something from it that you just know this is life. This is powerful. This is life-changing. This is God. He's at work in me. So I'm intaking the Word. So we'll, we'll talk about the Word of God and what that has to do with spiritual formation. We'll talk about worship and, and, and how our life is impacted through worship. Today, I want to talk to you about community and about, about church life. And I, I wondered, I questioned at least for a minute or two, what order this should be in and what, what you know, how should this look? Can I tell you that your, your church community, your church family, the life around church, it has the ability to impact every one of these other areas of your life in a great way. It will. It will, how you're receiving the word, how you're living out the word. It happens in community. The difference, the influence that you have outside of your community, your church family, the relationships that you form in, in the church family, those are impacted by, by what happens uh, right here in a great way. So we, I, I trust that the, the order on this, that today will, will really set the stage for what Holy Spirit wants to do in your life next week. So what is spiritual? formation, well, at the very most basic level, spiritual formation for us as a Christian, it's the process by which we become more like Jesus. It's the process by which we become more like Jesus by allowing God to shape and form us. How does he do it? He does it through our cooperation and our surrender. I want to take this definition, if you will, apart for us just for a couple of minutes. Spiritual formation for us as a believer is a process. Let me encourage some of you today because maybe you thought when I became a Christian and so many of you at celebration, you would either, in, in, in one case, you would say, well, I'm, I'm a brand new Christian. Others would say, hey, I've really stepped into something that's fresh and real for me. It wasn't, it's not something that I've experienced before, so it's new to you in, in that sense. And sometimes we have a lot of expectation of what can happen in our life instantaneously. That this, and salvation is that, isn't it? It's, it's one minute you're lost and the next minute you're found. You belong to Him. He's your Savior. He's your Lord. You're as saved as you're ever going to be, you're as much of a Christian as you're ever going to be, but you enter this process of him changing your life. And it's not about a legalism that says, I've got to get all of the rules, and, if I, and the days that I get more of the rules right than I get them wrong, I'm a better Christian. No, it's about one thing. It's not about the rules, but it is about becoming more like Jesus. 
every day. It's, it's not a, he didn't save you just to make you a better person. Yes, when you become more like Jesus, will you be a better person? Yes, but the goal is today I want to be more like Jesus. So it is the process. Spiritual formation is that process. It's trusting in God's perfect timing in your life. It's trusting that, that he's continually at work in your life. It, your spiritual formation, the process of it, it's going to involve dealing with some, some very real, some very deep emotional wounds in your life and some things that you've been through and allowing God layer by layer in your life to shape you, to change you, to mold you. He wants to do that one step at a time through persistent and diligent practices, a more meaningful prayer life, a more meaningful worship life, a more meaningful intake of the Word of God, and yes, a much more meaningful connection to the family of God, to the body of Christ, through, through your connection here. Can I tell you that, that what you do on Sunday morning and coming here and being a part of celebration, this is only a fraction of what God is doing at celebration. It's, it's just a part of it. It's an important part. It's a necessary part. We love Sunday morning, but it is only a fraction of the process of what God wants to do in your life. Celebration is not an event that you come to on Sunday. It's a family. It's a community. I'll talk to you some more about that in, in just a couple of minutes. So let's jump back into our definition. So it's a process by which we do what? Everybody say it. Become more like Jesus. Say it again. Become more like Jesus. I want you to, 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 to think about it. And before I can move on, I want you to, to connect with the, the reality that God's entire work of redemption in your life centers around this one thing. It's not your happiness, although it will make you happy. It's not. I, I loved the, 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 the way that song began about, about just... Um, Everything that doesn't lead to freedom, just my own way, my own life, my own feelings, all those things. And he said, this isn't freedom. Holy Spirit, make me more like Jesus. The, the, the goal is more like Jesus. And the whole work of redemption in your life is just that, that, that we become as a family closer to our older brother, Jesus, that we reflect him more by doing what? By allowing God to shape and form us through our cooperation and our surrender, slow and steady. It develops over a lifetime. For some of you that feel like you might be struggling, you might not be making progress, you might not be gaining ground, don't be discouraged. Don't be discouraged. Stay, stay in the fight. Stay in the battle. Engage in it. You're, you're going to have resistance. The enemy is against you. He is an adversary. When, but when you um, surrender to God, as you're going to see in the Scripture in a moment, when you cooperate with Him daily, uh, you become more like Jesus. I like to think about it in, a, in kind of a sports analogy. How many of you played a sport that you had to practice to get better at? Every, just about everybody. Um, you, you, you played a sport. Uh, for some sports, let's not think about the solo sports, kind of like golf or, or, or tennis, where it's not a team-type effort or not typically a team-type effort. Think of a sport like baseball where you, where you practice. Come on, how many of you, have, I mean, you at least play t-ball or baseball or something along the way. Oh, come on, hands. Let's get some hands up here. Okay, most everybody at some point, some of y'all like, I went out one time, I realized it was not for me, and you, uh, you at least went out one time. So the idea of coaching, I played, I played a little baseball through, I don't know, probably up until high school, and I loved it. I loved playing and engaging with that. I had some really good coaches along the way that meant a lot to me, and in the absence of, of my father being, being in my life, that was really special at times, especially in the, in the younger years. And I, and I thought about how coaching is interesting. They, they're there. They want so much for you. They, but here's the, the, the dual aspect of it. They realize you have to want it too. You have to show up for the practice, the coach, right? The coach isn't going to get you out of bed or get you out of um, whatever. To, you, you're going to have to show up. There's, there's this part that only you can, you, there's a part that only you can play in it. Um, 
A, a great coach, especially in those younger years, is not only going to tell you what to do, but they're going to show you what to do. I, I think about even my, my own uh, grandkids. Uh, uh, August, um, I think of August and, and Copeland at this point, that both of them are old enough to hold a bat, and they love hitting a, a ball. Right now, it's the big, giant, oversized bat and the ball that's about like a volleyball. But it's, um, it's a blast, and we get in the backyard, and because I'm left-handed, they're able, I'm kinda, they're able to kind of mirror what I do. So I'm able to show them in a mirror reflection uh, what to do. I hope I'm not teaching them anything bad or any wrong habits. If I am, they've got plenty of time to figure it out and undo it. But I'm teaching them. But, but, even, but, but you know, not great hand-eye coordination, not quite getting there yet. And let me tell you what the, 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 the most fun is. It's to go in behind them, wrap my, my own arms around them, help hold the bat for them. And when someone else would toss that ball our direction, Man, we'd swing, we'd knock the daylights out of that ball, and they're so excited, and they're running the little bases in the backyard, and they think they've hit a home run, and they don't realize that I, would, I had a whole lot to do with it, right? And our cooperation and surrender to the Holy Spirit is a lot of the same thing, isn't it? it it's recognizing, yeah, I, I have to show up for this. Listen, God's not going to get you out of, he's not going to airlift you from your bed to your living room chair to spend time with him in the morning. There's, there's something you bring to this. There, there's an engagement you bring to this. When it comes to community that I'll talk about in just a moment, um, there's something you bring to this. There are choices that you make to recognize that what happens here and in the periphery of here, or around the edges of what happens here on a Sunday morning, there is so much of what God wants um, in our life, for our life, and from our life that it really just can't be put in the same category as all the other things in our life. Every, let me say it like this. Everything else in our life has to fit around that we are a servant of, of the living God. We've surrendered our lives to him. Let's get into the word. Look at the word with me. Philippians chapter 2, verse 12 and 13. I think it encapsulates the whole, the whole principle here. Work hard to show the results of your salvation. Once again, you don't work for your salvation. How many of you know that? You're not working to be saved. But yet, the Apostle Paul, speaking to the church at Philippi, says here, look, you're, uh, there is something involved in you showing the results of your salvation. He explains it this way, obeying God and obeying Him with, read the next four words with me, deep reverence and fear. Obeying God, I'm going to show the fact that God is in my life, that he has saved me, that he's worked in my life, and I'm going to do it with a very deep reverence for him. There's not one other thing in your life that falls into this category. You're, you're, you, we do what we do out of reverence for God. The word fear, just so you don't misunderstand, it's not a sense of dread of God, that God's looking for an opportunity to, to come down on you. But when we talk about fear in this sense, it is, it is having that. It's having a sense of awe. Let me say it this way. It's a, it's a realization in your life that, that unlike anything else in my life, I have a responsibility to God. The creator of the universe has come to live in me. I work out what that salvation means with a reverence and an awe for him that one day I'll stand before him and I'll give an account of my life. Again, he's a good God. He's a faithful God. He loves us. He's gentle. He's kind. He's all those things. But one day, if we're believers, we'll stand before him and we'll give an account of our life. So he's saying, look, I've saved you. Now you work out. You, you have a part in working out the results of that salvation. And then he helps us to kind of understand both sides of what's going on in the second half of the verse when he says, for God is at work in you. You work hard, but God is at work in you doing what? Giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. We love the second part. I love that part of the verse. 
You've heard me teach from that part of the verse more than once that God wants to give you the desire and the power to do what pleases Him and He does it while you're working hard to show the results of your salvation. Some of y'all are like, Lord, I'm just going to lay up in this bed this morning. Give me the power and the desire to do what pleases you. And He says, well, you got a flesh. You get your flesh up out of the bed. You go in there and, and you find that place where you're, 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 you're connecting. Do it with a sense of reverence and awe. And, and spiritual disciplines are like that. So two necessary understandings for spiritual growth is I work and God works. I work and God works. The, the, these, both of these things are necessary. Both of these things are important for us to understand. I work, God works. You know, when I, when I, when I, I think about this, I, I have an illustration. I've used it many times through the years, but not in a long time. When I was a teenager, uh, one of the jobs I had, and I had a lot of odd jobs, I worked for a guy over in Monroe named, his name was Humble Ziegler. He had a lot of things going on. He was a director of, in some way, of the, the Monroe Civic Center. So he, he did that for a long time. I worked for him in, in concessions as a young teenager. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know what the laws were like in those days, but I was probably, in some cases, too young to do it. Made a big whopping $2.70 an hour. Next time you want to complain about what you make, just, um, come on, hey, how many of you ever had, you're old enough to have had a $2.70 an hour job? Or uh, some of y'all are like, I, I know what it's like to work for a dollar something an hour. Come on, where are my dollar something an hour people? All right, y'all, you've been around. It's like, yeah, I did that. It's like, some of y'all younger people are like, I can't believe they did that. Well, nothing costs what it costs now either. So anyway, I'm, I'm way off subject. So, so Humble Ziegler, I was like 15 years old, the best I can remember. And he owned some houses, so he'd have us, a few of the guys worked at these rental houses that he had. And he needed a form built in the driveway, it was one of those driveways, as I recall, that just kind of had two strips of concrete instead of the whole driveway, right? I'm sure it was more economical to do that from a concrete standpoint. Anyway, so we're working on that, and he's needing to redo it, and he leaves me and, and one or two other people that probably just know a very little bit more than I did, which was, I knew nothing, so they knew a little more than me about what we were to do. And, and so we built forms for the concrete. Took us next door, showed us, hey, this is what it's supposed to look like. We had a measuring tape. This is what we want this to look like. And we went and built forms for the concrete. We knew that what we were doing wasn't the final work. It wasn't the finished. All it would do would be to set the parameters for what would be the finished work. It was a form. How many of you have ever seen formed up concrete? You knew immediately that the form was not the finished product. The form was only setting the boundaries for the finished work. Here's the problem we have sometimes with spiritual formation in our lives. We want God, can I, without it seeming um, not reverent enough, can I compare God's Holy Spirit working in our life to the cement truck? We just want the cement truck to come and to pour the finished work into our life. God, just show up, just do this. God, I just need more peace, joy, and love, and I just need more patience, and, and God, I need to be, and, and we just can pray, and we can even get passionate about what we need God to do, but if God showed up in our life, we've not given him anything to work with. We've not put a parameter in place to say, Lord, I don't necessarily feel it, but I'm going to do an act of kindness here and an act of goodness here, and I'm going to demonstrate, look, I know that I'm just building forms, and that's all that I can do, but when you show up in my life to pour the finished work, the lasting work, I'm going to be ready for what you want to, I have prepared a place for you to finish the work in my life. I work, you work. I work, God works. Again, some of y'all are so resistant to the idea of, of work. Please just understand you don't work for your salvation. You're not working to be saved. You are working for your spiritual formation that changes your life and impacts the life of every other person around you when you grow up in Christ. When you begin to mature in Christ. So, so you're a part of, of that. You work 
and God works. Second Peter chapter three, verse 18 says this, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We grow. There, there's change, there's transformation, there's growth, there's something that blossoms in our, in our life. What is it? It is the grace of God and the knowledge of God. Some of you, your understanding of grace is, is correct but limited. Someone told you that grace is God's unmerited favor. It's when God does something that you don't deserve if you don't deserve salvation, you're saved by grace. Every bit of that's 100% true. But grace in the New Testament, when we understand what Paul is teaching us over and over throughout the New Testament, he is saying grace is God's empowerment. It is the empowering of God. It's God's equipping in your life. It's God's transformation in your life. When, even when scripture says you are saved by grace, he is saying you are saved and you're being saved by the empowering work of God in your life. He, he works. He's at work. So we grow in grace in that empowerment of God. It is necessary for you to grow. You don't, you're never going to stay the same. You have to grow. You're either growing or you're not. You're declining. And, and, and so it's God's empowerment. And this is the only way that our lives are going to align with God's will and God's purpose is for us to grow in grace and knowledge. What is the word knowledge here? It's, it's a word of an intimate knowledge of a personal relationship. It's not just information. There are people who, who profess to be Christians that have so much information but so little relationship with God. This is not about information. When he says knowledge, grow in knowledge, knowledge, the word know here is the word intimate. It's a close word. It's about closeness. And he's saying, look, you grow in, in God's ability to empower you, your, your efforts. You bring something to this in prayer, in worship, in the word of God, in community. You don't wait for something to happen. You bring something to it and the grace of God, the empowering of God, the relationship, the intimacy of your knowledge of God. It comes to bear on those environments and it changes everything. So what about formation? Whether you realize it or not, every one of us are being formed. We are not the source of anything. We are the product of something. You are either going to be the product of a, of a world environment that is seeking to conform you to its image. How many of you know we live in a world that's seeking to shape you to its, its values, its principles, its truths, its, its, re, its um, false realities, but what it calls reality. The world wants to shape you to its... You, you can either be conformed to the world um, the Bible teaches us, or you can be transformed. You, you can be transformed. So, so every one of us are being formed, whether we realize it or not. We are formed by three things. Now, now please distinguish this from, okay, prayer has a role in this. Worship has a place in this. The Bible has the biggest place in this. What I'm doing with the word, how I'm taking in, how it's changing me, my community. How are we? How, what, what are we formed by? Three things. And this is, this is really important. This is a really important part of this message. So I want you to hear me. I'll try to give this to you quickly because I want to talk about community. But, but what is it that forms us? Here's the first thing. What we believe about ourselves. It's the narrative. What narrative are you, are you believing? You're being formed by what you believe about yourself. What, do I, what, what is, impact does that have on the word? If you read the word through the filter of a bad narrative, it won't have the impact on your life that it could have, that it should have. If you read it through just your past, I'm not good enough, I'm too wounded, I'm not valuable, I don't have purpose, if you read it through your past, if you read it through your failures, if you just read it through an old story, what you believe about yourself will form you. So the question is, what lies are we believing? What, what lies are, are you believing a lie that says, I'm not good enough? Well, listen, you can pray, you can do a lot of things, but if you don't change the narrative about yourself, um, then something's not going to change. If you, if you, if you, Believe around a narrative of failure in your life. Well, I'm just a failure. I'm, I'm not going to ever be good enough. I'm not going to be as valuable as somebody else. So the question is, what, what, what lie are you believing? And then I would ask the question, what truth 
are we receiving? Is the truth you're receiving when you come before God's word is to say God's grace is enough. God's empowering in my life is enough. What God wants to do in my life is enough. The empowering of, of God. And so what truth am I receiving? Am I believing God's word when it says I'm more than a conqueror? Am I believing God's word when it says I am an overcomer, I am victorious? It changes the way I approach the word. When I say, God, I trust you, I trust your word, I believe what you've said. So, so narrative, narrative is forming us. Some of you need to do some self-reflection. Every one of us, I need to do self-reflection at time to say, listen, what narrative am I coming before God's word with? What narrative am I coming before prayer with? What is, what is, is the narrative that I'm believing. Second is, is what is the people that we do? Who are the people that we do life with? That's, that's forming us. It's our community. It's our relationships. It's our environment. They're forming us. You look at the five people you spend the most time with. And you want to know who you're going to be in a couple of years? You're going to be a composite of the people, five people you spend the most time with. That's just, that's just truth. It's just life. It's just the way it is. It's community. Community is important. Self-reflect. What relationships are forming me? What, how am I letting them form me? It's, it, again, it goes to this uh, subject of community and how important it is that I have right people because every one of y'all know your work life, your family life, somewhere, there's going to be some wrong people you just can't change out. Like, okay, I'm going to change you out. No, it doesn't work like that. Your boss is your boss right now, and, and, and that coworker is the coworker, and that family. And, and you say, well, they're not a good influence. Probably not. So, so what do we do to build around us a community where we're able to say, look, here's five people I'm spending time with. Here's my small group. Here's how I'm connecting with people through my serve at, at church. Here's the people that out of small groups and serves over the last year, two years, five years that I've just become connected with and we hang out together and we do life together and they are what is forming me. So it's the people you do life with. Third, it's the things that we consistently do. There's no way around it. You are being formed by your habits. You're being formed by your habits. What you do is really easy just to, to look at your life. Any one of us, again, could do a self-examination and say, hey, um, here's the habits. Here's the good ones. Here's the bad ones. Here's the... You, you want to do a self-examination? Here's one thing you can do. Think about your time and your money. I don't mean right now. You, you, don't, you don't really have time to do it well right now. Why not take 30 minutes in the morning and just think about what, do, what does my use of time and my, what does my use of, of money say about me? Say about how Christ has been formed in me. It, it, does it reflect who I am? Does it reflect who I am in Christ? Is my life being changed? Am I, is, my, or my, is who I am being formed around Christ? It's, it's my habits. It's what I do consistently. So... When we look at primary parts or components of spiritual formation, we believe and, and we were, are going to teach over just the short two weeks we have around the subjects of scripture, worship, prayer, and community. How am I taking in God's word? What does my worship life look like? My prayer life, how am I connecting with God through prayer? What am I talking to him about? What is he talking to me about? We're going to talk about that. How do we deepen that? I want to talk to you just for a couple of minutes about the importance of community. I start with this, and you'll see this in your notes. You can circle it. You can underline it if you want to. I want to give you a warning against consumerism. There are parts of your life where if you just simply go into them and say, I've got to figure out what's best for me, if, if you do this with your, with your health club, with your workout place, you do it with, I could name a multitude of other areas. They're not all coming to mind right now. I'm thinking dry cleaners, but I don't know how many people dry clean anything anymore. Right? You think about areas of your life where you could say, I'm a consumer and I'm interested in one thing, what's best for me. That's all well and good. When it comes to how you look at church, it is not. Treating church as a place to consume rather than a community to serve 
it, it can lead to very superficial formation in your life. It can keep you so surface in your life. I'm just here to get out of it what I can get out of it. I'm just here to, to show up to receive. Oh, I love the worship today. Oh, I connected with the word today. Oh, I, and, 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 and it's just something that I consume. You will never experience community in that environment and your, and your spiritual formation will just be handicapped. It, it will be, it will be um, thwarted. You'll, you'll never uh, reach a, a deepening spiritual discipline of what it means to be a part of a church family, a community, if you look at church as something you consume. Don't misunderstand that. My, my heart is for your needs to be met here. My heart is if you have kids, that there's a place where they can be served and they're going to learn about Jesus and they're going to be able to grow and, and there's going to be a welcoming environment. For heaven's sakes, we got a cafe out there where you can get coffee and a latte and something else. I don't even know what all they have out there. And we want you to have a great experience here. But let me tell you, the mindset has to be, this is my family. This is my family. I'm, I'm, I'm wanting to experience something that God's word that is very deeply rooted in God's word that has to do with my spiritual development. Who I'm going to become over the rest of my life here on earth is going to be formed at least in some part by the people that I connect with in community. And that's my church community. Let me tell you, this, this, this book right here, there is nothing that you can find in the New Testament that even discusses the notion that we would be anything other than connected in community. It assumes, let me say it like that. The New Testament assumes that you're going to belong to a local gathering of Christians. It doesn't have scripture that says, well, if you're, if you're in this situation, then that. But if you're in situ this situation, then, then that. No, it assumes that we are going to love one another. We're going to serve one another. We're going to encourage one another. We're going to admonish one another. That we're going to be in family together. Listen, it matters very much that you come here and that you have a sense, hey, pastor loves us he cares about us it is much more important it's much more important that you have a sense hey the people in this room care about me the people in this room love me. They, 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 they are strengthening me, and I want to strengthen them. They, they, they want to be a part of my life, and I want to be a part of theirs. They are encouraging to me, and I want to be an encouragement to them. You know, one of the, the best and most important things that we can do as a Christian is to recognize that we're a part of a family. That we're God's people, we're part of a family, that God designed us for the church family. And it, and it should um, represent everything that we know to be true in his word, that he has designed for a family, that it's true for us as the family of God. Maybe it's not always true in, in your family, but it is, it is true in the body of Christ. It's true for the people of God. You know, the best thing that anyone can do, maybe some of y'all have had this experience, I could give you examples for me over my life, especially in the years I was single in ministry, first few years of ministry, and having a family just take me in and treat me like family. We have families that do that here. I'm, I'm thinking about one that just takes people in and says, hey, you're our family. We're family, we're family. We want that, that's the best thing that someone can do for you, is to say, Hey, your family. What a special joy. Listen, we are designed to follow Jesus in community. We're designed to follow Jesus in community. Here's what I want you to do. Here's what I want you to do coming out of a message like this is to realize, look, this is, this is not just a piece of my life that I consider, should I lean into this more or not? Should I really take this to heart or not? This is a part of obeying God with reverence and fear is to recognize Lord, you put me in community, and this is part of working out my salvation is community. It is, it is connecting with a body. I, I love the work of, of John Mark Comer recently, his book, Practicing the Way. Many of y'all have connected to it. One of the principles that he teaches is establishing a rule of life. 
a rule of life being how you schedule your life and the practices that you set, schedule around your life and the relational rhythms, there's his word of how you, you live your life, that it's organized around um, God. And, 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 and so he says, look, this, this isn't about being legalistic. He says a rule of life is, it's not a set of rigid rules, but it's a guide to help us live intentionally. When you think about a rule of life, the goal of it is transformation in our life. And here's what I want to ask you to do. What kind of rule of life? Again, not a God's going to get me if I don't. Man, I was raised in church where if we didn't show up Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, revival services, whatever it was, it was like you're, not a, you're just not a good Christian. You just don't come on. Anybody else is legalistic, kind of legalistic around it. As a rule of life, we are saying, no, I've just decided that whatever else happens in my life, no matter what busy season I go through, no matter what else is going on, I've established as a rule of life the value of connection to the community. And I'm gonna put into it, I'm gonna put into it the work that, that as, as a rule of life, I've established a rhythm around this. This is an important that everything else in my life fits around that. Establishing Christian community, uh, establishing your life around a community of believers. Just a few things about that. My spiritual formation is not intended to be a solo endeavor, ever, ever. I'm, I'm going to cultivate community. This is not about what I can do, it's about what we can do. I will nurture a sense of belonging. I'll nurture a sense of belonging and accountability. I'll, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna recognize we're a family. Here's what we want to say to each other. We want to be able to say it sincerely. I'm here to help you. I'm here to support you. I need your help. I need your support. I'm on a spiritual journey. Hey, I see where you are on your spiritual journey. I want to connect with you. So I'll nurture that sense of belonging, that sense of accountability. I'll, I'll, I'll make an ongoing effort toward de depth and, and vulnerability. And man, that is so difficult. But, but, it, but I recognize that it's important for me and it's important for you that it's not surface relationships. I'm going to actively commit to other like-minded people for support. I'm going to build a, a network around myself through my small groups, through my serving, through my church family. I'm going to, for one simple reason, I want to be more like Jesus. I want to be more like Jesus. And he connected. He saw his followers, his family. He loved them. He served them. He did life with them. And that's what we're here to do. I want to close with just a, a few quick steps. A few quick things that, that I can give you. I believe that next week, Angela will probably close with something similar to this to help you to take the next step in these areas. Here's what I want to encourage every one of us to do. If you still have your notes out, I want you to fill in these blanks. I believe this is important. I believe, here's what I want to do. Let's, uh, give me 30 seconds. Let's pray and let's just ask the Holy Spirit to speak to us right now. Holy Spirit, I thank you that you're here. God, I thank you that woven in the fabric of everything I've said, there's a message to every heart. And Lord, you're gentle and you're gracious and you're kind. And so Lord, I pray that, that anywhere the message is, has had a weightiness to it, Lord, that it settles in a, in a good soil in our heart and that good fruit grows out of your word today. And God, I pray that every person will take a very practical and real step based on these few points in Jesus' name. We thank you, Lord. We receive it. Here's, here's, some, here's some practical ways. I want to ask you to begin with, this week, begin immediately, maybe even today. Begin with a small step. I'm not asking you today to determine, I'm just going to, man, today's the day. I'm, I'm crossing the line. I'm committing my entire life to, to being in, in community. And I, that'd be great. That'd be nice. I want you to do something, though. I want you to start with a small step. I want you to maybe ask yourself the questions like, like questions like this. Who is it that I can encourage today? I'm talking about as Christians. I'm talking about Christian community. I'm talking about strengthening. If you think about your Christian community as a fabric that is woven together, how can I weave another thread into my sense of closeness and community? 
Quit waiting for someone else to do this. You make a choice. You say, hey, who can I call? Holy Spirit, is there anybody you want to put on my mind today that I could call? And for some of you, it'd be a call to say thank you. You have been such an important part of my community. I want to thank you for that. Some of you right now, the Holy Spirit may be bringing someone to mind. Write it down. If you're like me, you'll forget. Write it down. I'm going to call this person today. I'm going to thank them for the investment they've made in in, in, in helping me on my journey and formation in my life. Who is it that you could call to encourage? Who is it that might would need the strength that you could give today? Who, Who can you connect with? Who can you, a small step, begin with a small step. Who can I serve? Who can I call? Who can I thank? Who can I encourage? Who can I, who can I check on? How can I begin to take a step toward deeper community? Um, I set some reachable goals. I mean, this is going to be true next week when it comes to the, the Word of God, it comes to your prayer life, it comes to worship. I, I want you right now to think about, we're right here, we're in the middle of June, we have a couple of months of summer, we have about four more small groups left in this semester, but we'll be getting ready for a 13-week fall semester of small groups. I want you to think about, hey, I can, I can get plugged in. I mean, we'll, every semester we'll have a few people, they, they sign up for like seven groups. And I'm thinking, let's do something that's reachable. And if you're the seven group person, which all seven, great. Get in one and connect. Get, you know, if two works for you. Um, but but, but take, do something that's reachable and stick with it. Recognize that you're on a journey that's a lifetime journey. It's a lifetime journey. How long is he going to work on you? Till he comes back to get you. He's not going to be finished with you. He's, he's working on you. He's working in you. He's changing you. He's forming you. He's shaping you. And, and, and so we're going to just, along the way, recognize he knows us better than we know ourselves, And we're going to do some things that are attainable, that are reachable. Third, you have to anticipate resistance. Anticipate it. When you decide... If, if out of this message today and if out of next week's message, you make some decisions in your life to say, you know, I'm going to quit being conformed and shaped as much as I have been by things around me. And I'm really going to dig into to allowing God to shape me and allow his word to change me. There won't be one step forward in your life that goes unresisted by the enemy. Not one step forward, not one thing you do that you won't meet the resistance. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm not trying to make you feel like, hey, this is, man, this, the devil, there's the devil around every corner or something. I'm just saying that when you make decisions to move forward in your relationship with God, your connection to other people, and you recognize, hey, this isn't just a piece of my life. This is my life, and everything else fits around it. Everything else is shaped around it. And you begin to take steps in that direction, the enemy's going to find 10 ways to Sunday to resist you and fight you. Anticipate it. Expect that that's going to happen. Um, don't take the mindset that you're a victim. He, he resists every one of us, right? You're not special in that sense to him, right? Well, the devil's just been fighting me really hard. Hey, he fights every one of us that have made a decision to love Jesus and serve him and honor him with our lives. He's against us. And he'll find a way to push back. He'll find a way to bring you into some of the greatest seasons of temptation in your life, of fear, of doubt, and questions. We're going to help you with some of those things this summer. One of the messages is going to be how to deal with my doubts. We're going to help you with some of those things. The enemy is going to resist you. Anticipate that. Fourth, um, I would challenge you if you don't already have somebody, and I, 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 Pose these final thoughts as if you're just kind of getting started in this and none of these things are in place in your life. I'm a, I hope that with many of you, they are. But if you don't have somebody, if you feel like I'm just kind of a lone ranger right now and I just show up when I can and I'm in, I'm out and I'm not connecting, let me challenge you to find a partner. Find somebody spiritually that you can do this journey with. Where are you going to find them? You're probably going to find them through a serve team, through a small group. 
You're, you know, if, if you don't have anybody, that's a great place to start. And come to Discover Celebration, begin to get connected with family, begin to just take some steps in the right directions. And I promise you, God has the people you need. Fifth, it's the hardest for some of y'all because y'all are like, how many of y'all like people that, and, and some of you are, it's just like, okay, we're going to get this done. What are the steps? Let's get it done. Let's move on to something else. It's kind of like just, we, we call it around here, we, we get our land the plane people together. It's kind of like, we can be all over the place. We need some people to say, this is how it's going to get done. How many of y'all just get it done people? I need to tell you that's going to be a challenge for your spiritual formation because it's a process. Look at what scripture says. It says it's so much better than I can. Matter of fact, I'm gonna give you 10 seconds. Put your notes away after you write the word process. And I want us just to take a minute and really internalize God's word right now. I want everybody to get real still as quick as you can and look at the screen with me. I'm gonna read it to you. I'm not gonna ask you to read it, but I want you to follow it very closely. The Apostle Paul writing to his believing friends and, and those that have, have come under his, his ministry and his leadership at, at, at a church in a city called Philippi, he says this to them, I am convinced and sure of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will continue until the day of Jesus Christ right up until the time of his return. You signed up for a lifetime work. There's so much there, but let me just say God's not finished with you. He's not finished working on you. He's not finished working in you right up until the time of, of his return, developing that good work and perfecting and bringing it to full completion in you. Trust God's process. Some of you may, maybe I'm speaking to someone who just feels like, I don't know if I'm getting anywhere with this Christianity thing. I just feel like quitting. I feel like giving up. I speak to a discouraged soul today and say he's faithful to finish the work. He's faithful to finish the work. I say to a tempted brother, he's faithful to finish the work. God is at work in you. He loves you. He's faithful to finish the work. I'm confident of it. Let's let him do it. Let's show up. Let's work hard. And let's trust that it is God who is at work in us. Close your eyes with me for just a moment. I want you right now, some of you may be at a place where you're saying, I'm, I'm, I need a fresh start. I want to start over. I want to begin again with God. It's really been about me and my efforts and I just want to submit and surrender to God and trust Him. I need to commit, I need to recommit my life to Him. Would you just slip your hand up high enough that I can see it? I want to pray with you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Come on, anybody else, real quick. Anybody in the gallery? Yes, sir. I see you. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. I see you. Thank you. All right, I want to pray with you as we close in just a moment. Holy Spirit, I thank you that you're speaking today, that you're working in our life. God, if, you, if, if we leave today seeing any one thing, let us see that you're working in us. And Lord, I just feel so compelled to say again, God, if there's anything about the word today that, that landed in the mind in a place where it seems impossible or it seems difficult or... Someone would say, my life is just so busy. I don't know how to do this. Lord, just allow right now a, a sweet peace to settle over every person in this room to recognize that if you've called them, that you'll equip them, that if you've called them, that you're transforming them, that it doesn't matter in the snapshot of today where they are, that you are a God who is working over their entire lifetime. And that they're going to be an incomplete work all the way up until the time you come and perfect us and bring us into your presence. So Lord, I speak courage 
over this room today, over every person, every person who knows you, every person who loves you, every person who says, I'm a Jesus follower who has chosen you, Lord, who has given their life to you. I speak over them courage and strength and life and victory and power to become everything you've called them to be. Nothing is impossible with you. With man, it may be impossible, but nothing is impossible with you. And you're forming us, God, into a family that understands this and knows this. And God, you are making us for our city, for our region, everything you've called us to be. And I thank you for every person in this room. I speak a special blessing over every dad God, their influence goes beyond their work influence. It goes beyond any friendship. God, they have a strategic influence in their family. God, I pray over their fathering that you would lead them if they're fathering infants, toddlers, teenagers. God, if they are still parenting adult children, God, I pray courage over them, strength over them, that they will use their godly influence for your glory in shaping a generation to come to know you, to trust you, to serve you, to love you. I praise you and I thank you in Jesus' name.